يس اند ذن يا مين اللي طلب هنا؟ خلص هلا بس بعد يخلص اوكي اند ذن يا بيس Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for raising that. Um, I, I can, I can talk uh, for for a long, long time on that. But simply to say this, if you look at the competitiveness of any country, region, economy, to me the ultimate underlying factor for competitiveness is human capital, is human talent. And in my mind, there are only two ways to really build your human talent. You can actually set up the conditions to attract and then retain the human talent, and that I'm sure many countries are doing, or you have to think about how to train and, and assess and, 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 and really develop your own human capital. There's really only two ways, and sometimes these could be synergistic. As a small community in Hong Kong, we're well aware of that. We are well aware of the fact that uh, we actually are the training ground and exposure for a large region in, in our part of the world, and we're very conscious of that. But the only thing I would say also is that when you actually think about education, and, and I know this country has made tremendous strides. I was talking uh, uh, to, to my, my friend Mohammed here, uh, that uh, the illiteracy rate in this country is less than 3%. So this is absolutely a fantastic achievement. But one thing I would say is classroom education is one thing. Uh, exposure to the world is another. So I would emphasize greatly the idea of opening exposure uh, to, the, to the external world for your young people. And I always say, and I have repeatedly acted upon, the idea that for a young person early in their career to have some exposure overseas of a meaningful period, like half a year to a year, will fundamentally change that young person's outlook on life. And if we are here to train our next generation of leaders, we must give them that global exposure early in their careers, early in their careers. So I, I think this idea of combining classroom education uh, and with this idea of global uh, exposure, I think is absolutely essential. And for us to train the next uh, generation of global leaders and global citizens, I think it's uh, very important. And I hope in this respect, in practical terms, that we can see a lot more exchange between the Arab world and the Asia Pacific. It's uh, too long been the hub and spoke. <laughs> I think the spoke has to start talking to each other also. Not to ignore the, the hub, of course, I'm not saying that. But the, the whole thing must work as a multipolar, multipolar world, yes. Peace. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fan. Yes. Very interesting lecture. Uh, I'm not an economist, so my question or my comment will be more about politics. Yes. And the effect of politics on what you have said. Your uh, presentation was purely economic in approach. <laughs> I'm an economist. <laughs> it assumes, yeah. I think, uh, more or less natural growth, mm -hmm. special efforts here and there. Mm -hmm supply and demand and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. But I think the world is not as fair as it sounds, particularly uh, in the economic field. Uh, politics, whether we are talking about world politics or regional or even local, sometimes distort uh, natural or yeah. the expected yeah. natural growth in the economic field. So do you think the world politics, you know, here in our region we feel it maybe more than in other regions. But do you think it has a big influence on what you have said about in changing your approach, which I think is an optimistic approach? Yeah. Thank you. Well, that, that is an excellent question. I, I don't pretend to be able to at all give uh, sensible answers to that question. But one thing does strike me from our experience in the Asia-Pacific region 
And I tried to somewhat imply that in the remarks that I made, that obviously things are impacted by the, um, the political regimes, okay, and the path is not smooth. But I would say that the experience in the Asia Pacific area is almost irrespective of political regimes. We have seen this tremendous development. And it has to do with something in my mind that may be going even deeper than politics. It's the ability of an, of the deeper than the political system. It's the willingness of the society actually to open up and embrace globalization. Now, of course, political considerations affect whether society wants to open up and how it opens up. But the fact that the society and the people actually opens up is enough to produce the phenomenon that I'm talking about that has actually impacted the Asia Pacific, regardless of the political regimes. And we've seen the examples of India versus China, which is very different political regimes, in my mind, achieving very similar effects. And all these, Japan is, is, is different also. So you, you, the politics are absolutely on top, but the fact that the, the bottom opens up in a similar way I think allows the development uh, that, that I'm talking about regardless of the political system. Now, so that's, uh, now that, that is a very sweeping statement, but, but that's at least true. So, so I, I, I think there's always a balance. Very serious political problem, of course, could totally disrupt the process. But within a range, what is very important is this uh, recommitment to, to looking at things in an outward-oriented basis, embracing what I, I use the term generic to have globalization and willingness to accept change. I think it's really, uh, and, and that's, that, that's something that could be instilled in different cultures and different political systems. So that's, that's what um, uh, my, my, my thought would be. But I, I certainly would not, uh, would not doubt your comment that uh, politics absolutely have a total impact on this, but I'm not very competent to, to actually <laughs> talk about that <laughs> because I'm certainly may, an may, amateur in politics. I may come, I may come to <laughs> Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I, I have a long life uh, theory that politics are the servants of economy and that every political decision <laughs> is for <laughs> economic interests. And if that is not the case, then the statesman, the leader, the president, the, the, the ruler, whoever it is, is not doing his right job because his job is to serve the people through economic security development welfare etc so and i want to give a very 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 near uh, very example from near development it's just the very recent developments in europe when when europe went up shouting against russia why didn't they take any action against russia they have the military power, they have the political power with their American allies. It's the economic interests. Because Europe is dependent on Russia, on power resources, gas, oil, etc. And because of their economic interests. Now, this is, and this is the good rule of, 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 of law. And this is the good, uh, a good statesman attitude. I should do what is right. And politics are a tool for implementing economic aims. And that is always the case. So yes, politics is very important, and political decisions are very important. But uh, I, have not, I have not seen a political position which is not based on an economic objective or which has an, a, an economic result. Every political decision is either prompted by economic interests or as is to achieve economic results. Anyway, that's my own perspective, which you may agree or disagree to.